Here. Councilor Johnson. Here. And I'm here, all present and accounted for. Uh, we're going to begin by uh, approving the minutes from a, a couple of past meetings. But bef before we do that, I'd like to, first of all, uh, apologize for the long agenda. I know it's been a challenge for the town manager and staff to get all the stuff together, the, all of the reports and the information that were requested. So, uh, and the, the reason that we're doing this is in part, I, I, I want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, we recognize the extra effort and the quantity and the quality of work completed. So I want to thank you for that. It's a great package and I appreciate this having been communicated uh, you know, to us uh, so that we can get it in front of the council, hopefully in some fashion, and also it's out there for the public to see as well. So I want to thank everybody for the extra efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, any agenda items that we don't finish tonight, we will uh, will be taken up at the November 27th Finance Committee meeting. Um, and, um, you know, the other aspect of this is we wanted to make sure that we try to get back into some sort of quarterly cadence, if we can, to review um, our financial performance. And I know that a lot of this is tied up with making sure we have audited results. So we're going to be looking at unaudited results this, uh, this evening, recognizing that they're not final. So it's, there's no intent to here to try to micromanage the work of the staff or the town manager. It's simply to help us all get a better grasp of the income expenses, value of our assets, that sort of thing. So metrics to help us hopefully manage, you know, the financial aspects of, of the town together more effectively. So, um, so with that, I'd like to ask for uh, 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 a motion to approve the minutes from the June 26th and the September 17th um, Finance Committee meetings. So moved. Second. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And uh, also, one small footnote, uh, I don't mind doing minutes, but i <laughs> not very good at it, and I tend to kind of take verbatim notes, and so if the minutes are a little long, that's the reason. So, <laughs> apologies for that. Uh, so, with that, I think we'll just turn it over to, uh, to Tom and staff, mm -hmm. and um, we'll kind of walk through uh, the material that you're presenting. So, thank sure. you. I appreciate your comments about being on a uh, consistent um, financial reporting uh, cadence, and it escapes me, but um, we had been doing that fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why we got tripped up uh, in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I, I don't remember the circumstance. So uh, what you have before you this evening is actually uh, end of year last year, uh, unaudited, and then uh, Q1 for the current year. And if it pleases you, we can kind of walk through those. Great. Uh, also, I'll just preface perhaps uh, for Councilors Johnson and Hamill's benefit, this is a kind of a reporting format that has evolved, I'll say, over years. Peter can attest to that. Um, our position has always been we want to present information in the format that makes sense to you, and it's providing the level of detail. So we remain wide open for feedback if there's a different and more appropriate method to convey that information. Great. Hey, so, Tom, just a quick mm -hmm. process question, if I may. So do you want us to ask questions along the way, or you want to try to get to a break point in each segment? What's your preference? Yeah, probably as you go, so yeah, okay. we can, we can okay. move, you know, hopefully answer them quickly and move right through. Yep, great. <coughs> so, Ruth, uh, typically we have Ruth uh, walk us through this, if great. that's okay. Thanks, Ruth. Yep, and um, so I have an executive summary that kind of goes over the highlights of the year. Um, I can read it verbatim if you want, or I can just answer questions if you have any. Uh, the, I kind of focus on our revenues, our expenditures, where fund balance is or should be, and uh, then I talk a little bit, not very much, about the assets and liabilities because what's in those is really dependent on what comes out of the income statement. And then some positive indicators that we had and some, some negative ones, and uh, so that's pretty much what the summary goes over, and I can answer hopefully any questions you might have on that. And then following that are the various uh, quarterly statements that we present. And, and when I say quarterly, they're actually quarterly, but semi-year-to-date also. So, you know, December's won't just be the quarter of December. It will be a six-month review. One thing I was going to mention, whenever I talk about a balance sheet, what I have in mind is, is physical assets, land, equipment, those kinds of things. I know that's not typical. I guess in a municipal accounting format. So when I see when I look for assets and I see cash and receivables, then I uh, you know 
Uh, we do have the those. They usually yeah. those are things we usually update and maintain yeah. at year end. Yeah. So I'd, I'd ask that if we could get that, if I know we asked specifically for a property listing, for example, but if you could share with us then the breakdown as a follow-up of, of physical assets as well. And I don't know what the traditional uh, methodology is for reporting those, but that would be helpful, Ruth. Thanks. Yeah, uh, the only problem or the only issue would be that once we put them in, they won't change until the following year. Yeah. So, but they'll be there at least. Yeah. But I, I thought since we did the year end, yeah. if we could have a look at them and then, um, you know, make sure at least we've got that as a, as a baseline. We may not typically have looked at it in the past, but I thought it would be very helpful if we mm -hmm. had that. Thank you. Uh, one other question I had for you was, uh, why, why do we not recognize receivables? Are we recognize them when they're billed but not received, is that right? We, uh, we're, we're on what's called a modified accrual basis. Yeah. And what that means is that some revenues are booked as revenues when, it, when they happen. The two that we currently are doing that with are the property taxes and rescue billing. All of the other ones are pretty much cash basis. So I see. We record the revenue, at, not as a receivable, but as a revenue when, yeah. when we actually collect the money. Okay. And then you adjust to the ones that are that are just recorded when they're collected? I mean, you reconcile? Oh, right. So, like, uh, taxes receivable unaudited at June 30th would be 1138 for example. Uh, June 30th, 2019, that's on page 3 of the June 30 ones and so it would show tax receivable of a million one thirty eight and you know next quarter hopefully that number has gone down a little bit so let us see yeah. or it would have gone way up because property taxes for the current year are there but now they can start to, to diminish so what that really means is as of June 30th, for these statements anyway, out of the 60 plus million that we might have had for property taxes, the unpaid balance is a million 138, and that includes not just 2018's taxes, but right. all of the old ones prior to that that might still be outstanding. Does that, does that ever go down? Or is that, a, is that a steady climb year after year? Actually, um, as you'll see on the revenue side of things, I usually put in a percentage of where we are with yep. uh, taxes. And, and last year, uh, we were better collected than we were in the prior oh, year. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Not by mm -hmm. lots of money, but you know, yep. 98 point something to 99 point something. So it's gone up. And I have a topical question about, so one of the negatives, although it's not necessarily a negative here, about community service being overspent, but also took in more revenue. Is that historically one of the di most difficult departments to predict due to our, with childcare and the space limitations and all that good and stuff? It, yeah, it has to do with enrollment. So, you know, if they, they may budget for, I'm making numbers up here, right, but right. they may uh, budget for 20 students to do a program. And, if, you know, if they get 30 students, they still have the program. But now they have to buy, you know, additional T-shirts or more food right. or whatever it is that they're doing for that program. So that's what makes it a little bit more difficult. And as a standalone department, they they have the smallest delta as far as taxpayer burden, correct? Correct. Yeah, far. By yeah. far, right. They're in the mid '80s. Their user fee. Yeah. So seven percent self-funded, I think. And I know Peter Hayes has mentioned this a few times, but when we're looking at increasing revenues, that's clearly a place to increase revenues. I would. Well, there's some, there's some areas that uh, I would call stranded costs, uh, particularly our senior programs. Historically, we've, we've wanted to keep those rates in check. And so yep. uh, right now, the revenues coming in for senior programs don't cover the cost. To, so, uh, um, Grounds and maintenance is another one. There's yep. no revenues for those. Sure. So it's hard Unless to we get the school to pay us for us doing the grounds and maintenance, there's really no one to pay that bill. Sure. I'll work on that. We'll, be <laughs> 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 it's an easy ask. <laughs> I mean, a couple. There's a couple of comments and questions, and just for for both Don and Paul, what we try to do is the first page is really kind of the executive sort of highlight, so you don't yep. have to go through all the numbers. Um, so a couple things I had if, in your second paragraph, you talk about during 2019 <coughs> budget process, we're concerned about the excise tax revenues, um, and we increased it 
by 250, but I, I, in that next paragraph, a sentence, so the two fees related that we actually exceeded the excise tax estimate by 483,000 or total revenue by 483? No, that was just the excise. How could we, wow. what was the, what drove, I mean, that's that's over 100% variance. What, what drove? It, it's been that process for the past four or five years, whatever we budget, we've always come in higher. I, I think in the past we've kind of felt that we're we're getting to that point where that's not going to continue. Oh, I know we ag we ag agonized over yeah. routine. Can we add Every fifty thousand? Can we add fifty thousand? What if we're off? And but the other piece is that we also register uh, big Mac trucks, and okay. we get a portion of those Mac truck revenues, excise revenues from the state. The state collects those, and uh, the staff go through some form that they have to fill out and they submit it to the state and the state gives us our portion and that's about fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars. So it's for what? Large, large trucks. Excise uh, on large all, all trucks. The snow trucks and the snow oh no, no. Yeah. Trailers. Yeah. Trailers. Yeah. Big yeah. tractor yeah. trailers. Big trucks. So the other one, this Peter, it might be uh, actually one of the, the good things about growth. As we get more residents, those people are now registering their car yeah. in our town. So I, I think we've got that's something we really haven't accounted for. We've been look, looking backward at history right. and always been optimistic but cautious at the same time. So where are we this year? So that, that would have been a total revenue of close to five seven hundred fifty thousand in excise. What do we have in the budget for this calendar year? Are we gonna is there gonna be a windfall here again for us, yeah. hopefully? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Finance well, directors are typically very conservative, so I <laughs> try not to say that too much. However, uh, because I think we're pretty, I think we kind of pegged it to where we thought it was going to be last year. So there, we, we there's probably some we, upside. Yeah, we thought we were going to hit our. And I then, think we bumped it up slightly, but not not really aggressively. So, so we're not at the, we're not at the 750 level then in the budget. Well, we budget in the millions for excise. So that seven that two hundred fifty thousand was an increase over FY eighteen that we agonized over, and then it came in. Right. Uh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, so gotcha, it's gotcha. so we came in a hundred eighty thousand over what we th thought we were going to with the. Just the increase, correct? Right. Yeah. So we budget like five point seven million or something like that, okay. and we came in at five point nine or, or gotcha. something along those lines. Current year we're budgeted at six one five six million one hundred fifty thousand to date after first quarter. We, and this is on the back page yeah. of the September. That's the second 30. part, correct? Correct. Yeah. Uh, we collected 1.736. So we've collected about 28% yes. in the first so, quarter. Right. So there should be some. There, there yeah. might be some cyclical, you know, year end buying. <clears throat> I, I can't predict yeah. what cons what drives consumers. Christmas presents for the spouse. Yeah. And then, and then, <laughs> and then my second question really is the last paragraph in this page, and it's really a question. I guess for Don and Paul and us as a finance committee, and this is about what our goals are for what we want to have as funds. Yep. And we're sure. Um, I don't think we've made a conscious effort. Can we? Can we make a conscious effort to budget monies to get to the fund balances we want? Or are we ethically not precluded from? Or Typically, you don't budget money for that. Oh, I know we don't. But if we want to get to that 10%, what is our mechanism? Frankly, the way communities do it is they overstate their uh, overlay, and any unspent funds fall to fund balance. And, and we have always been trying to be razor thin and only raise the money that we think we need to, to fund abatements in the year. Uh, I think that's the typical method of communities that, that build these huge fund balances. So, so I think a question for us at the finance committee, they're sure we're going to struggle with, we want to create an equipment reserve. Yeah, we're playing catch up, right? And, and if we want to do something to get to the targeted fund balances, because that, it's a question for Joe, but if you're looking ahead to the school bonding, the closer we are to our policies on where we want to be for all of these things might make some percentage differences in the, in the rates. So yeah. as an overlay issue, or we've got, so that's going to be a challenge this year of the budget. So I just, I just raised that. Um, so we'll need a strategy for that or some sort of mechanism to recover it other than us shooting high 
like other towns do, right? I mean, or or we ask. I think what we've done in the past, what we did last year, is as we get closer to the budget, we ask to build into the budget that's presented an equipment reserve yeah. amount, mm -hmm. and, and maybe we yeah. ask to build in something to get the the overlay to contribute to the fund balance if that's what we want yeah. to do. By by law, the assessor has the ability to commit overlay up to 5% of something and we're never ever... It's an obscene number. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it would it's be not. several million dollars. Right, I mean we would never get that high, right. but that would... And the, the reason we don't, that's the final, uh, essentially the final decision before he, he sets the tax rate. By then the budget's known, you know, all the exemptions are known, so on and so forth, and literally the final number to put in is what the overlay amount is, and that determines the tax rate. And a penny matters. Yeah. And, and that's available right on that, that one sheet worksheet that yep. you check. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Last yeah, puzzle piece. Um, uh, regarding Peter's comment about um, you know looking ahead towards things that might need to be bonded and interest rate, when Joe and I were talking a couple of years ago now about the metrics proposed to this committee that we should be tracking, you'll notice that on your dashboard it's not tracking unassigned fund balance, it's tracking unrestricted. And so in Joe's opinion, what the bond, what the um, rating agencies are looking for more is that unrestricted fund balance, which is far more inclusive than the unassigned, and that we should be really aiming to be greater than 13% in his opinion. That that's, and so when we look at um, S&P and Moody's both release kind of the things that they're looking for, and they list that unrestricted fund balance as a factor in their decision making. Because it's not necessarily so much what we have in unassigned fund balance, it's how much money we have in reserves kind of more generally. And so, uh, while certainly we would want to be hitting our policy, I'm not suggesting that there should be a, a um, an policy gap. But I, I think that for, as far as a uh, expending mm -hmm. any sort of worry or stress about that specific number as regarding the, the rating agencies, um, my understanding from Joe is that that number is not nearly as important to them as that unrestricted, unrestricted number. Yeah. But but the unrestricted though, based jumping ahead, is at twelve point six eight, right? Yes, which and is still higher than it was three years ago. So right, we saw a slight goal. dip because the, it's unrestricted includes unassigned. So when unassigned goes down, unrestricted <coughs> gets hit too. So certainly. But but again, it's the same. So if if you're saying we should be over thirteen, in an ideal can, world, we can do the calculus to say. What is that gap between 13 and 12.68? Yep. As a number. What, what the other doing? part of that analysis, and Joe is best to, to give us guidance. My recollection, um, we are we have very good rating. Uh, for us to go up, we'll have to really make some vast improvements in that area in particular. Uh, the reward for that is might have been as much as 10 basis points, mm. which, which matters. Mm. Um, yeah. Most importantly, we can't fall. I mean, we still mm. enjoy right. tremendous uh, right. you know, right. opportunities in the in the bond market. So I think that's the thing, the cautionary note that I'm ever mindful of. Let's do no harm so we reduce right. our rating. For us to gain, we've got to, it's going to hurt. <laughs> and, and there's fairly small returns for that gain. Additionally, if we wanted to, instead of using the unassigned, which is in the, the policy, you know, maybe we change it to unrestricted. So we, and, and unrestricted is defined in our policy as including the unassigned, assigned, and committed fund balances. So. I mean, that, that's an option also. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm not trying to solve it tonight. I'm just trying to, yeah. I'm just trying to raise that awareness that, that we certainly don't want it to fall. And, and we know, we heard last time, if, if debt increases quickly, that's, that will be something that will catch the eye. So as we approach those time points, it's just something to think about. Um, the other question I had on negative indicators, the executive budget was overspent by about 238000 <coughs> Um, it seemed that a big chunk of that was legal. Um, it looked like, based on your explanation on page four, it was 173 the prior year, 73 for this year. Um, and, and I guess just for us, I think we've always sort of underestimated legal in our budget. I mean, at least we have the last couple of years, right? Yes. I just think probably legal as is, long as the, uh, hmm. the legal suits. People like yeah. to sue the town for some reason, I don't know why. But, but just say that's probably something we should look at and understand and, and kind of look at. And then the only other question I had a community service where I heard your explanation about we overspent 87, we had additional revenues of 136. Are they directly linked? I mean, was it the 
So if we got more program revenue because more kids participated, is that why we overspent? Or was there a, something else we spent money yep. on that was unrelated to? I think uh, most of it would be related to the programs that they have. If, if they double the number of uh, attendees, then that means they might have to hire more staff than they had, you know, originally estimated part-time staff to, to handle the overflow and things of that nature. To, I guess to be specific to your question, um, I'm not aware that we've done anything that we didn't intend to. I think it's yeah. really program-driven. Program -driven. And I can verify with Todd if you'd like to. Thank you. So uh, I think, go ahead. But the only other thing I was going to say was, uh, you know, as we overspend certain lines, for example, the legal, then that tends to, you know, that hits our fund balance that we didn't really intend to hit. Now the excise, fortunately, has been compensating for that a little bit. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's one of the things the rating agencies kind of said was, you know, you're overspending. Okay, great, you're overcollecting, but we, we need to, I guess, improve on that a little bit if we can. In terms of our budgets. So to that last part again, we should need to improve on what? I think we need to take a look at our, for example, our legal and to probably try and do some uh, some kind of analysis because if this were a one-year thing and it was just an anomaly, that would be one thing, but we've been consistently over for the past few years. And I'm, I'm guessing re related to the you know property taxes, uh, you know we can probably expect that there may be additional uh, you know actions coming out of that at some point. I don't know; it's hard to predict, but yeah. um, and I, that's the problem; it's hard I, to predict yeah. what's going to happen. So, so. Uh, and I know the timing factor as well in terms of when these things make their way through the court system is also hard to predict. Um, it's a better criticism. We've chronically underfunded. Yeah. Legal. And I think the problem, but I think for me, the, the learning is when we have these things, yeah. we tend to always underestimate yeah. what it costs us not to settle, but mm -hmm. to continue to kind yeah, of right. To we fight. don't do that cost-benefit analysis. So, so sometimes settling early, yeah. you know, if right. you add it up, the accumulative impact of yeah. the overrun, so yeah. it, it's, uh, it's a lot of money yeah. for legal. Yeah. Well, let, let's hope we work towards that with. Walmart recently. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's good that, I yeah. think that'll be good for yeah. us to yeah. have a discussion around that and work through the reasoning around okay. why that happens and when, it, when, it, uh, when it's appropriate. I want to make sure, we, at least I know we're not going to try to solve for this now uh, before we move off the, the update of the financials, but I think it will be important for us to make sure at least we have the, have defined clearly the problem statements. So, you know, one is how to address uh, unassigned and unre you know unrestricted fund balance. You know what what plans will we need to put in place to make sure that we recover that or get back on track with that or at least not raid the fund <laughs> this this next cycle. Uh, so that's one issue. I think the other issue is uh, I would just say generally where we have big deltas where we have red numbers. I know I know that you flag them and and you have notes r related to them. But I'm particularly interested in anything we identify that might be. Uh, systemic issue or something that we you know and might take uh more than one year to deal with as an issue so i want to make sure we try to call call those out i know debt is one of those and, and we'll get into the metrics in a minute but i don't know if there are any other ones like that in terms of problem statements we want to make sure we have boarded so that we don't lose track of it so two quick things would be just keeping with peter's thread with legal having experiences like i believe two times perhaps three um I think it would be helpful if we actually set up some sort of protocol or some sort of um, process when we are making those decisions on are we settling, are we continuing. It would be, I think there's times that we could have a more well-prepared cost-benefit analysis possibly before us, before we make those decisions. Um, so I don't want to, I mean, I know we do this stuff in executive session, so I'm not trying to speak specifically to anything, right? But I think that it would probably be possible at some times to have a cost-benefit analysis that has some numerical values to it at times when we make certain decisions about are we going to con continue with this proceeding or are we going to, I, I feel like a lot of times we, we have a solid idea of the numbers and the possible cost-benefit analysis, but I feel like that could be more well-defined as a decision-making body, then we might be more effective to make that decision of, are we proceeding, are we taking this further, or are we settling? Yeah. Uh, so just a thought from my personal experience. Um, and one quick question for Ruth, just just pure, this is out of pure curiosity. Can you explain our credit card uh, processing fees and how they're, 
how they're covered. I, I mean, I know as a resident, I go in and I pay my extra money if I use my debit card, right? Does that cover all our processing fees, or does that not even come? Is that a drop in the bucket, or how does? The credit card processing fees, we the town used to uh, pay for all of those credit yep, card fees. Right, but correct. they have to be uh, pretty exorbitant, like right. more than $100,000. Right. Yeah. And so we uh, worked with the vendors, and we started charging uh, or passing those costs right. on to the citizen. Uh, the recreation program software that we currently use, and we're working with them, but currently they do not allow us. Right to pass those fees on. Okay. Uh, community services has been working to uh, accept less over-the-counter cash and checks and do more with credit cards and, and <coughs> signing folks up electronically. Yep. And so that's what's generating. That's adding to our that's cost, adding correct? To the cost. Okay. Now this year, and so this year and a little bit of last year it has been a uh, Let's see what the cost is. Right. So last year we did take a, a pretty good hit. We did adjust our expenditures to offset that. Community services has also adjusted their revenue schedule to yeah. help offset that. And then the goal always is to get them to uh, get the vendor to allow us to pass those fees on. So so this, if I'm hearing you right, this is just our vendors don't have, are not equipped to do that this. one vendor. So our online sign-up portal is not allowing us to do this. Is that correct. a correct statement? Okay, and is that so? Is that the biggest area of loss for us? For that's the only. That's it. That's it. That's the only one. Cause because when I'm registering my car, I'm covering all the you're fees. You're covering that cost. So right now, the biggest hole, so to speak, is community service is the processing software. fees. Correct. Okay. And, and then in the, we, we'll get you the order of magnitude, but uh, you know, in the whole scheme of things, um, we have people paying tens of thousands of dollars right. in um, in taxes on their credit card. Mm, yeah. Not because out of necessity, it was they could get points and right. it was right. an mm -hmm. easy way to do it, and we yeah. paid the fees. Yeah. So we put a stop to that. Sure. So this is the other one that we need to pay attention to. Right. And hey. we keep trying to get them to change. Uh, initially, we couldn't pass any of those. Fees Correct. Right. It was illegal. Right. Change the law. Right. So is that um, so is that hundred thousand what we suffered? Or not suffered, but is that hundred thousand from community service alone? Or oh no, that you, was way in the past. That was way in the past, yeah, correct? So right now, what's the number? What's a rough number that we're talking about now? Or what line is it? I should say. It is. So for June, I don't have my September reports here right now. It's fine. I mean, we can. So that's year end. Year end. Yeah, for the year end one. Credit card fee. I am not funding it. So. We can follow up. Yeah, it's gonna. This makes uh, for good TV. I did not get it. Yeah. I yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> try, try to fill some space. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd just be interested to know. Yeah. And do you know on the school side if there's something similar for like the school lunch program or is that out of our purview? I just That's I, not added to our costs. I yeah. think they're passing those costs on as well, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Has, has anybody explored a vendor that could, or is that cost prohibitive to explore a vendor that would help us absorb those costs or? Uh, I think it's okay. the type of programs that community services uses so it's you know that would be kind of like converting to right. different software our assessing system. package okay. <laughs> and the well, process that went it's worth looking into uh, but we can. let's first get get you yeah right i'm just to right talk about risk and, yep. uh, and return fair enough i want to say we budgeted like fifteen thousand last year and we okay. spent like right. 30. Okay. so it was kind of double what we thought we were going yep. to spend right let's verify that we can get that back okay to you. uh also just so you know we're also working on uh, beginning the process hopefully by December of accepting property taxes online initially yep. and then we hope Good. to expand that out so uh, that's another fee that we get passed on to the, the user of yep. the service okay awesome Great. thank you okay so um, okay for us to move now to the uh, any other no, questions move, move to what? the metrics well, no, I, I have a quick question about sure. the first quarter of 19. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, first quarter of 19, you say, we are beginning to see the general, general assistance costs increase as asylum seekers arrive in Scarborough. Do we know 
for the year what impact that might have on the budget? And all inclusive with everything that's going to be in? We can do some estimating. Uh, it depends whether they continue to reside here, but um, and, and whether additional ones, I don't say ones, but additional um, applicants qualify and, and get general assistance. But for those that we currently are providing, we can do some estimating. Yeah, maybe, I mean, just because it's, it's, it wasn't in the budget, so it just says is whether how big of a red box is it. If it's like I believe it's, uh, we get a 7% reimbursement from the state for those costs, but you're right. Um, there's still a local portion that's that's borne by us, and historically we've had very, very low general assistance costs, uh, yeah. remarkably low. But, but just, you know, maybe the next quarterly report, just some type of estimate of where we are and what it might look like for the year. I'm just trying to, as we think ahead to the budget and some other things, what, what will the impact be on the funds this year? And mm -hmm. All of those things. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Doug. So, so just and so you know, for, last year we budgeted 14600 for the credit card fees. We spent 30800 yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's those reward cards. And then, and then the negative comments on 19 again, where legal expenditures are 56% of spend, so it looks like that may be a budget variance this year again, too. Yeah. So, so uh, if you're halfway through, by the end of first quarter, right? And we know we've got stuff pending. Yeah. yeah. So we've got. That's one data point. But <clears throat> I know we may be going back here, but you just come flag one. But on parking violation revenues, this is the same issue related to the credit card discussion you had, or is it something different? Um, is how do we collect them? Do you, uh, do you happen to know? Those are billed to the customer, and they can either pay. I don't know if they can pay online yet, but they yeah. usually with checks and things like that. So we get a parking ticket, and we send something to. Uh, to the violator, right? To the finance, correct, yeah. either one. So. Well, it'll be on their windshield. They, they get the ticket, and that constitutes the fine as well. So yeah. that's, they come in with their yellow or yeah. colored, yeah. colored orange ticket, uh, either at the window here or mail it in. And, and as a FYI for everyone, if they don't pay it by a certain time frame, yeah. the fee just about doubles okay. if it doesn't double. So yeah. it's, you know, if it's $40, then if they don't pay it by the day, right. now it's $80. But this is mainly town-wide issues, not necessarily herd park parking or... Correct. It's, right? it's wherever so, they park the... It's when I leave my car on the street overnight on East Grand Avenue. <laughs> they are very good at parking. Like well, actually, is this driven, is this driven by the co-op parking? The fact that we've collected so much, or is it because we're coming out of the summertime? I think it's more Bayview, quite frankly. Um, Which one? What is it? More, more Higgins Beach okay. focus yeah. than co-op or anything Pine Point. Because we're at 42% collected after the first quarter, correct? So we're ahead of, right. And, and that also but includes, it's summertime. Yep. you know, the, the fines forfeits includes uh, a dog at large fee or too much yep. noise fee or planning you didn't do, which we're supposed to do fee, you know, right. sort of thing. So it includes more than just the parking fees. Right. Other enforcement correct. fees. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, thanks again. I'm so really a great report, great detail. I mean, for the most part, uh, Things you know look overall pretty good, except for a couple of problem areas. So I think that, and it, it uh, helps us try to focus on what those areas are and try to prioritize those in terms of action. So additional uh, deliberation. So thank you. Do you think I, I just to so appreciate uh, the legal fees that covers uh, any representation for the assessor through the abatement process? Yep. We don't have a lawyer unless there's a lawyer on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the BAR mm -hmm. has its own lawyer, and that. In all cases, uh, ordinance development, we've had a, a fair amount of ordinance development work uh, that requires the town attorney's time. Yep. Personnel um, issues. Yep. Personnel, luckily, isn't a yep. big cost, but you know, the, all those things add up yeah. for sure. More activity. So yep. not just the, uh, the big notable litigation that we're involved with, yep. it's all the other legal assistance that comes with it. That's a fair point. Thanks. That's, that's uh, helpful. And actually, yep. the discussion about parking fees triggered something at one point. I know at one point, we were going to look at the resources that it takes to patrol Higgins Beach because I think it was almost two full-time equivalents. Yep. Um, for because at some point the thought was the parking fees were going to offset cost, but as we think about budget, is it the best use to have officers and police patrols at Higgins? So, it, so I think as part of the budget process, it'd be interesting to look at what does it cost us to have you know, public safety down at Higgins Beach writing tickets, what do we get in, what's the delta, and is that a great investment for the town 
going forward. So. Yeah, I thought a lot of this stuff was automated. Now, like you go into Portland, you can't park for ten minutes anywhere without getting a, you know, putting a something in your windshield. Do you have to? Does that require an enforcement person to give you a ticket in order for that to flag, or isn't that done? Sure. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. still need yeah, still physical need a, person checking uh, it. Meter person. They, they do have higher staff in the summertime yeah. to, to specifically yeah. to do that. So, yeah. so could we have that analysis done at some point just about yeah. what is what is the total all-in cost for officers at Higgins Beach versus yeah. what we're getting in revenue? Yeah. A cost-benefit analysis yeah. of parking cost enforcement at Higgins yeah. Beach? While we're looking at that, can we throw in the possibility of just getting a, you know, I know we're talking about herd park and other areas where we use attendance. You know, my in-laws were famous for making lots of money by sitting in a folding chair at a parking lot under an umbrella all, all summer and collecting tickets. And uh, it's always a very good margin for the family. Yeah, right. uh, so I, isn't there a way for us to use a machine like that where you go in and there's a little there's a little gate that comes down and you take a ticket at Herd Park and you go in and, you know, otherwise you don't get in. Is that part of the redesign <laughs> discussion? It is. I don't know. It is. Right. <laughs> to go to the, to 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 go to the meeting at Fine Point Fire Station. <laughs> sure. I, we've started with those meters at like Higgins Beach. Yeah. And uh, there, there have been some issues, but you know, I think they're looking to expand that program. I yeah. thought Bruce was trying to do that way back in the day, but the cost yeah. at that point was a little but, high. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think it's important because we did have that conversation. We have treated Higgins Beach differently than the other beaches, and it was because Higgins was going to be a pilot. Yeah. So if we've piloted it and it's not something we can duplicate, does that mean you know, so I, I think it, it all folds into a broader conversation, but I suspect this budget process year, this year is going to be tough, especially if we want to build the reserves we just talked about. So I think we need to look at the other things we're doing that may or may not make sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, certainly as a counselor, I've gotten more complaints about Higgins Beach and the parking than just about any other issue. So yeah. it's, 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 it's a sore for the community in some ways. Okay. Maybe this is a good time to uh, move on to metrics. And uh, I don't know how does everybody feel about the two pager. When I read it, I thought of you know I was feeling better about it rather than the one pager. I'm still, <laughs> still missing an arrow in one of the columns. But because it's going to be. We talked about that when these metrics were adapted. <laughs> and I did have a question. Adopted about rather. Cohorts, you know. So, but we're. we're I digress, so we'll give you a chance to. Okay, so okay. Um, yeah, That's let's great. talk about it. So we have um, two pages, and that gave more space. Um, it's one page if you look far back. <laughs> Good point. Um, so underneath uh, the next kind of row down is goal limit for those that had both a goal and a limit per policy, and limit or goal if it just had one stated. You'll notice that we don't have those on non-property tax revenue as a percent of assessed value, general fund expenditure as a percent of assessed value, or qualified applicants to the tax assistance program. There are no industry standards for the non-property tax revenue as a percent of assessed value, or the general fund expenditure as a percentage of assessed value, nor is that in our policy. Um, and there was quite a bit of discussion. I don't think that it's really possible to set a goal target for the qualified applicants to the tax assistance program. Mm -hmm. So those three don't have those um, goals and limits. Um, I thought it would be interesting, instead of trying to put in, a, in this limited space, trying to put in a graph that showed trends over time, I thought we could experiment with this three-year average, and it would give you a sense a little bit about yeah, where we're that's standing a good idea. in comparison. Yeah, a rolling, it'd be a rolling three-year, like yep. next three years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, I can extend it once, if you'd like. I, we can go to five. I mean, it, it really, it's up to you how many years you want to have there, but I, I pulled together three. Um, and then the cohort average, so in your packet, immediately following um, the example. So we had talked last time, a couple of years ago, I was just kind of looking at some communities that we could work with to do some debt capacity analysis. And the GFOA, um, Ruth, Gen Government Finance Officers Association? Government. Okay. They publish each year a um, set of financial metrics from communities that have earned their Excellence in Accounting Award, of which we are a member community for now 13 years running. And so I thought it would be a good group of, a good place to start with data because it would ensure that we were looking at communities that were reporting their data in a way that we 
also report hours. So we're making sure to um, compare apples to apples as much as possible. And so this, these co this cohort, same cohort, both the left table and the right table, I just wanted to kind of highlight why I think that this cohort actually is somewhat valid. So I took, they said it for the entire United States. I narrowed it down to just New England, and then I further narrowed it to New England populations between 10 and 20,000. And when I did that, you'll notice that whether you sort it by population or by income per capita, the town of Scarborough was right about in the middle for both of those different ways of sorting. And I, I think that that lends some support for this being at least a decent place to start with a cohort. So I just I wanted to show you the communities that were included in that cohort and explain where that data set came from. What happened in Massachusetts? They dropped off the map. Here. Well, most of their towns are not between <laughs> ten and, and thirty thousand. Okay, they're a little bigger. Okay, and they maybe they're just not very good at winning awards. What happened to Maine? Maine. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go back into that. the other part of the Massachusetts Bay. Right. What happened to them? Yeah. So yeah, in Maine, that's why you're only seeing Gorham and Falmouth in Maine as well. It's because those are the only two communities between 10 and 30,000 residents yep. that are that have been awarded this from the GFOA. Huh. Okay. So on your back to your metrics sheet, if you'd like. I can, so that you can get a sense of where we stand in relationship to others, I think I understood that this might be of interest to you last time, the cohorts average could go in that, in that row. Mm -hmm. So you could see what like-sized, like, -sized, like um, demographics communities are doing with each of those metrics. Seems like a lot of work, though, to calculate that. Um, it's not, because the GFOA basically does it for me. Nice. They, they send me all of the data in these lovely columns, and I just have to do a couple of quick um, divide this column by this column, and it, it all works out. So it's not a very heavy lift. Hmm. Um, but it would require you saying, yes, we like this cohort, or identifying a different cohort. Well, I think what might be helpful would be to, you know, that's your recommendation to use that cohort. Or is to do it, see what the numbers look like, and then if the numbers look really funky, okay, we can say, gee, maybe that's not a good cohort or not. But if, if it matches up pretty closely to us, then we can say, gee, that might be a good. Well, I will tell you because I've looked at them. So I have the data from so you fifteen. Have that. Well, I have fifteen's data, which is why I didn't put it in because yeah. that seemed unjust to be comparing twenty fifteen to twenty eighteen. That's not matching, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to purchase twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen's oh. data without having some idea that you liked this idea. So um, we could do a couple of things. I, I will tell you that as of 2015, comparing Scarborough's to this cohort, our debt service, our total debt, our debt per capita, and our total debt per capita as a percentage of per capita income are significantly higher than the median for the cohort, mm, which, is okay? which is not surprising. And I think we're going to find that for most cohorts we pulled together. Mm. What I think doesn't make this an invalid cohort sample, though, is the other metrics that are similar. Things like, um, well, just geographic area. Let's just start there. These are New England communities that are, so they're sharing somewhat similar economic base to us in some ways. Their size and, and really their demographics as far as what is their median household income. I wouldn't want us looking at a community that was 20,000 people in size but had a median household income that was half of ours or that was double ours. Those are, those, those are not going to represent um, ability to pay as a, as a comparable measure. Yeah, I, so I think that the one, one part of it is definitely the, the validity question. <coughs> the other part of it is, well then, you know, how can we make sense of this when we're talking to the community, talking to the public, you know, trying to educate what we're doing and why. So, um, and I, I suppose we probably need to do more analysis to, to determine that, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure people start asking the same questions we did, you know, why no, Where's Maine? Where's Mass? And and we go from there. One thing that I also thought was kind of interesting, I was trying to think, who are we most like on those two data points? And it's uh, it's Newport, Rhode Island. So I thought, in terms of uh, who are we closest to in terms of population and income per, per, per capita, it looks like look like uh, unless I'm dreaming here. Well, on the right hand one, we certainly are. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for Newport on the left hand side. They're I mean they're fairly close. Their population yeah. is at 25. Thousand. Yeah. No tennis museum here. <laughs> well, I think I guess it doesn't make sense to me to to see how this ends up and then adjust it after the fact. I think we should define if this is valid first yeah. and actually go with it. Yeah. Um, I 
expressed this at the last meeting. I, I think I'm slightly different than my partners here. I, I don't care so much that, and I'm probably not going to make a ton of friends of the people that are watching. I don't care so much that there's not anybody, that it's not so representative of Maine because if we're not comparable to South Portland or Portland, then, then so be it. So yep. I think the purposes of, on a finance level, for the purposes of these metrics, I'd rather us determine, is this it? And then, and then let these be honest. Yep. If, if, yep. if the cohort average isn't what we like, or mm -hmm. to me, then tossing in a couple of other main towns isn't, might not be an honest projection of where we are. Good point. So that's where I would be yep. for it. I think the challenge becomes, though, <clears throat> as we've spent three or four years trying to get this done, Right. Um, the other thing we'd ask for, and you know, we haven't gotten there yet, was what are some metrics we should use on <coughs> the school side also? Mm -hmm. And the problem becomes on the school side, the cohort reports we've always used right. are the Falmouths and the Arnold and the yeah. Cape Elizabeth. Yeah. So, you know, it's how do we balance that? If, if we don't have any main sort of cohort in this sample, mm -hmm. and the Board of Education continues to use the other sample, are we kind of picking and choosing? So I, I, I don't know how you reconcile yeah. that. So yeah. there's kind of no yeah. issues there. Right. I can yeah. absolutely use that same cohort average line. <clears throat> I believe what they referred to it as was an aspirational cohort. In the, in the study that was done by the school department in 2015 or 2016. Oh, I put a line in for that. I'm sorry? Put a line in for the aspiration. Yep, or just use that cohort average. If you want to be consistent cohort to cohort, I can do these metrics for those towns. So we don't have to use this set of towns. We can simply use those main towns that the school identified as the cohort that they used to do their, uh, what was the name of the study that they did back in 16? No, I think it was. Um, it wasn't but, yeah. but they 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 had but they had two set cohorts. They had an aspirational cohort, and they had a cohort that included Wyndham and a couple of other towns based so, on like school lunch, uh, free and reduced lunch percentages, and some other factors. So we have a couple of established cohorts that the school has used for for comparison purposes before that we can certainly use and and just calculate these to them. Um, I simply had this cohort had picked out for. A kind of a financial analysis purpose and so I thought I'd toss it out to you but it certainly doesn't need to be used we can use a main only cohort if you'd prefer or could you could you just add another I can do both I can add have another box. I can have New England cohort another average box. I was say, oh, I got it. we're still the <laughs> government uh, well, <laughs> we have enough space on the page so we could have a New England I cohort think, average and a main cohort average. I think if you did that that might answer some of the critics Great. issues that we can Councillor Johnson's made an elephant argument why that's the cohort, cohort that he's interested in. You've made an argument that that is a representative, but we then can answer the other question about the consistency between. And, and again, what we're trying to do, and, and again, this is for the chair, this is still sort of a work in progress, but I think our goal was if there's any way we can get this for this city council, yeah. and yeah. just say, here's a draft. Yeah. Yeah. We have kind of picked at it. Is there anything else major yeah. they see that they'd yeah. like to see? And it works out of committee, and in that way, we can decide what to do with it. Yeah. Council can decide. Yeah. I, I think it's great work. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. I mean, if we're brainstorming, I mean, perhaps local co cohort, yeah. financial cohort, or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. just to, yeah. you know. And I think it'd be good for us to socialize it. I mean, we have people that have become active in terms of their own individual efforts uh, around doing quantitative analysis, you know, the quant jockeys that the regional has, has unleashed. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, not sure uh, John Cloutier here. So, so I, you know, it would be kind of nice just to kind of bounce, you know, bounce yes. it off them, you know, just to get some feedback, you know, socialize it a little okay. bit. Okay, I have one other question to ask. So we've got this blank box at the bottom here yeah. on page two, and, um, Councilor Hamill, when you asked for um, some analysis on where we stood with policy and statutory debt limits, yep. I thought maybe we could use that box to, sh Terrific. to update that annually. Terrific. And Terrific. so if that works for you, then that's what the final draft would include. Yeah. So if you want this to go to the currently seated council, it would need to go to the November 6th meeting, so prior to coming back to you. So if you were comfortable with 
directing staff to add a main cohort average line, add that debt limitation analysis at the bottom. And if we could all agree, though, that I am not going to have any numbers in those cohort averages between right. now and November 6th, right. um, that would be a final template, if you yeah, will. Right. And then we'll have the audit done, and this will come back to you or the next finance committee meet the next finance committee January, February, um, with all the numbers filled in. Okay. Do, do we need a motion for that? Well, before we do, are we going to define what the main cohort is going to do, be, or are we asking Larissa to do that work? So we asked her for two things, as I recall. One was to, I, I thought there was an acceptance that this is a financial cohort. Yep, agreed. The, the headcount and the yep. per capita income. In and the main cohort, is it? Is it Maine or is it we doing Grid no, Portland? I, I think she said she, she was, was going to use. We're tasking her to come. I think I was suggesting that we already have an established cohort that the school Perfect. identified. Okay. We're going to use that and same. Use that one. Yeah. All right, yeah, that's that's cohort. Cool. That, to your point, that would be great. From so their study in the same. 2015 or 2016, I can't remember the, the, the year that it went out, but I, I have the study, I can see it in my head, okay. and yeah. I can just pull those great. towns. Okay. And Thank you for the great clarification. Thanks for moving this along. I know it's been a bumpy road. And just last question, because I have attention deficit disorder. <laughs> On the risk score, can you just, can you yeah. tell me what the risk Good score question. was again? Yep. I, so, I know you had a complex behind I did. the scenes I calculation, did. but. Um, can you just tell us on uh, what, what a 7 versus a 17? Yes, I can. So, um, and I should have put out of 25 on there. So okay. each element was assigned a risk score between 0 and 25. And 25 being good 25 is the highest risk possible. Gotcha. 0 okay. being no risk. And that gotcha. was determined by taking each of these elements and assessing it on a score of one to five about its likelihood of occurrence, okay? And then if it did occur, what would the impact to the town be? And what would the negative, rather, impact to the town be if that were to happen? So when we look at, let's look at the one that has the highest. So total debt per capita is a percentage of per capita income. So um, that was assessed as saying, well, what's the likelihood that the total debt per capita as a percentage of per capita income is going to increase? And between Joe and I, we averaged it out, I think it came out somewhere like four, okay? And then what would the impact be in a negative way to the town? And when I think about that, I think about it not just from a resident standpoint, but also from a budgetary standpoint, okay? What would the impact of that be? Well, fairly significant. And so when we multiply those two fairly significant things together, you end up with that 17. So for when we look at, con um, if you look at the opposite end, unrestricted fund balance as a percentage of revenues, the risk score on that is 1.5. Right. So, not, so yeah, it's fairly likely that that may fluctuate, but the impact to us actually is quite low. So, and we talked about it at the last meeting, this was done as an example, just to kind of find out if you liked it. Mm -hmm. um, Joe and I were the only ones that participated in that. I heard very clearly from all of you that, and I agree with this, that that should be expanded to more people. Um, maybe that is something that you guys could really decide. Like that's, I think, a policy decision mm -hmm. to, as far as who's included in that risk assessment. So is it your town manager and your uh, municipal advisor and the chair of the finance committee? Is it you know yeah. something along those lines yeah. that sets uh, um, Clearly, who's making that assessment yeah, each year? You name the Board of Governors right. who come up with that, yeah. Okay. Great. So we don't we don't need a motion for this to put it in to get it in front of the council I and mean, we get a consensus though. Well she's That's gonna come back to yeah. we're doing back this one to more time, us. I think one. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not if you want it to go to this current council. I don't I can't be, get it to you again. Get two meetings in before January. Yeah, right? I mean so, so if you need a motion, I just make a, a motion that this draft document goes to the next town council meeting for input from you know, like other council members and then it will go back and come to us later and I you don't need that part of the motion but mm -hmm. just can you uh, make that as a motion then please yeah mm -hmm. that was the motion we'll take that as a motion do I have a second <laughs> Could you repeat the motion? The motion is that we are just the motion is to have staff go back, clean this up, have it in the documents for the next town council meeting. And it'll be there for discussion. As, a as a next November sixth. Yes, at the, November the next 6th. meeting. November sixth is the next town council meeting. There'll be Day some blanks still, today. Paul. Like the cohorts won't be. That'll be a new council. No, they're not seated until 
a week later. Oh, okay. right. Remember? <laughs> no, that's the, I don't. That's the, the kitty table. table. That's yeah. right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, we, the, I only intent, to, okay, the only intent to bring it back is just the continuity. We've been, I mean, the only intent to bring it back is the continuity is just to get it to this council. Yes. We've talked about it. I'm sorry. Yes. Get their input. If it dramatically changes, then there's a chance to get it the work so the new finance committee can pick it up when they come back. Gotcha. And we thought we'd make a formal motion this time so our committee, we can remember what we did. Yeah, okay. why it gets I appreciate there. everybody so explaining we see it, everything oh, back to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to second it. All in favor. Yes. I got thank confused you. by the current council. Thank, thank, thank you for the coaching. That's good. So <laughs> I like that. A little <laughs> help from the sidelines is always good. Well, we have the chair of the council and the chair of the finance committee. I don't see this as a uh, scheduled agenda item. Okay. Perhaps the finance chair will have copies. You could distribute them yep. and you could either speak to it yeah. or do that on the up. committee updates. It's not I think an action item, is what you're saying? Committee yeah. updates, yeah. yeah. That's typically okay. how it's done. Good. We're making good use of those. Not an action items. Nice right. work. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks for your persistence. Happy to do so. Really good job on that. Uh, we've got a couple other agenda items here, uh, and I want to make sure we still are following somewhat of a priority order on these. But uh, Tom prepared some information on the status of the public safety building. Uh, so we, that would be very sure. helpful, I think, for Tom for us to take us through that, and we could talk about the, the remaining agenda items after that. Thanks. All right, I include in your packet an updated. Uh, financial overview um, as of last Friday, so it's, uh, it bears the date of the 17th of October, wherever that date was. Uh, that's showing the current funding gap to fill. We turn to the third page and see with the bottom line in red of $523,214. And that really should be compared against the 420000 and change that we started with. So. Yes, that gap is widened, but it's uh, not widened significantly, and we can provide detail as to what has caused that. There's been a lot of things in a project of that size uh, that happen over the course of construction. So that's a, a matter that we still need to wrestle with. Uh, I've been holding out hope, um, really pinning my hopes uh, to the sale of the public safety building, because uh, if that goes uh, in the right direction, that could be the answer to our problems. I, I'm, that hope is fleeting just to, with the passing months. I, I do actually have uh, in a position to convene the council in executive session and share uh, the potential for a, um, a contract. Um, I can say that it doesn't answer all of our problems, but I think it's certainly worthy of consideration. Right. So the council probably starting and through this committee will have to wrestle with and identify where we're going to come up with the additional funds. Speaking of that, Tom, can you, can you refresh us? I thought when it came back to us and it was the 400 or so, there were some specific things we identified as potential funding sources. One, there is, I don't know, salt shed or something we got money for. Did we earmark that and set it aside, or did that money flow into the? We didn't. Uh, basically, the council just blessed us, said, uh, go forth and prosper. We'll figure it out later. And I think part of the conversation was, let's figure out what are we doing with the old building? What's, what's that gap? So the council did not take action uh, it was about a year ago, uh, October of 18, the uh, building committee appeared before you with the final numbers. Right. Right. And I wanted to refresh my memory. I included in your packet. This was, this was the presentation that evening. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, we yes, we, we talked about it, but there was no action that ident no identified. Action that we did. Okay. Many of those, all of those, will be identified in the year end financials. Uh, so, uh, those will now become fund balance, so to speak. Right, so those are just going to fund balance per se. So whether you designated them last year and they did not become fund balance or we held off that decision for now, it's still, frankly, going to hit the same unless there's some other revenue source that I'm not aware of. So reducing the size of the building is probably no longer an option. <laughs> well, <laughs> take that one off the, the list. The, the committee sat before the, the council at the time a year ago and was very uh, proud of the fact that um, you know they had cut 2.3 million out um, and they were able yeah. to maintain uh, square footage and they yeah. thought that that was yeah. really important to maintain yeah. those principles. Yeah. So in all seriousness, seriousness, we know the pressure that the group is dealing with, a lot of things out of their control, uh, you know, building costs, labor shortages, those kinds of things. We understand that and the size and scale of this, the complexity. So, and we, we appreciate that they have been focused mm -hmm. on this, but we still have a gap. And, uh, you know, we, we started the meeting by talking about recovering 
you know, unrestricted fund balance levels and things like that. I'm sure we're going to get lots of other things uh, putting pressure on this coming budget cycle. So uh, that's the reason for why uh, we brought it up as an agenda item. So just to boil this down, we're looking at selling the public safety building and going to fund balance. Is that what we're looking at? or No. I mean, the, the public safety building, we didn't borrow as much money as we thought we needed because we were counting on the No, I know. I'm selling, selling the old public safety building, right? And what else are we looking at to cover that gap? You're looking for scenarios, right? Right. I'm just looking for the scenarios. At this juncture, it's going to be fund balance. Right. Like, I think we could that's, okay, perhaps that's, that's look at question. our current year to see if things are trending. Excise, for instance, you could have some level of confidence based on projections where we'll end the current year. Uh, but there's not many. I mean, that's what we're looking at, right? I mean, I suppose theoretically you could uh, appropriate money in next year's budget, but uh, we'll have bills to pay right. before then. Or modify this year's budget. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not prepared tonight to, to sure. give you that list, yep. but, uh, yep. it, but you know, it was a good question. And, yep. and that's, that's it's a short list, though. It's a short okay. list of options for us. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, I think what would be important, though, as we get closer to the budget season, so if, if we are going to ask that we put in the budget a certain amount for the equipment reserve and a certain right. amount to rebuild reserves, I think that the, the sooner we get an idea of where we think we're going to end up this year, because yeah, excise tax might be up, but here's a five hundred thousand dollar nut, and any other thing. So if we could, the best we can, try to figure sure. out where those numbers are going to be, you know, six months in would be helpful as we. Yeah, having a sense year. of where we'll end the current year, that's going to be hard. We'll still have six months of experience, right. but may give you more comfort to use fund balance because we know it's going to be replenish, if, if you will. I'm not saying it very articulately, but if, if there are additional revenues or I guess there could also be cost savings in the current year um, that would give us comfort to use fund balance such that at the end of the year it's going to replace those funds that are potentially would be used for this project. But, but it still <coughs> becomes a budget issue. If, if our goal is not to dip into fund balance, reduce it from where it is as we ended last year, Right. we're going to use those funds, that means we should have a replenishment consideration in the budget. So it's just more of, mm -hmm. as Tom yeah. builds mm -hmm. the budget, you know, what are some placeholders we're going to want for reserves and for the reserves? You know, we're fixated on fund balance, and in a perfect world, we would not be having this conversation. But if you think of it, this is what fund balance is for. This is, this is cash that we have on hand. Right. There are potentially consequences of using that money, but mm -hmm. uh, in essence, uh, you know, that, that's what its purpose is. The, for contingencies, right? For, for unexpected. And this, argue, this is not unexpected. Right. But. So, but it does kind of raise the question. I remember, Ruth, we've talked about this in the past. What happens in years where uh, something may get funded um, but not used? You know, um, for example, I remember we talked about my favorite intersection. Uh, the, the, the smart lights at Dunstan. We got it approved one year. We didn't, you know, buy the software and implement it immediately. We did it in a subsequent fiscal year. Are there things like that where there may be uh, other favorabilities or things that we could use for other purposes or not, or not? If we are intending to bond those different things uh, and we've bonded them, then we're restricted by law to use it for the purpose for intended. Purpose. Okay. Uh, if we haven't bonded it, then we can redirect it. It's an accrual issue, right? It's just a... And it would require council action to redirect, yeah. uh, reauthorize the funds and for different And if we purpose. don't... Um, the other piece is that if at the end of the year we know we're going to complete the project, we just haven't done it yet or we haven't started it, whatever, what we do is we essentially show a carry forward in the general fund. If it's capital projects, it's off on its own right. side anyway. But uh, the capital equipment ones that are pretty much just generally automatically carried forward into the next year, and those are part of that un uh, committed or assigned fund balance. So uh, Peter, to your point, it's extremely well taken. Um, I'm feeling as though we need to have final answers and an uh, understanding by year end. So in advance of the budget, for sure. So, so we can be clear. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're supposed to be moving in the new building uh, 
April 1st or so. Right. And so uh, we've already committed through contract uh, payment of these funds. And so um, I'll need to have a clear indication where those monies are coming from sooner than later. Yeah, and is it a bigger issue if, if we do not sell the old public safety building? That's also a cash shortfall on the yes. short term. So yes. are you saying it's, it's a bigger mouse trap than the 500? It no. Be. no, but it's not the answer to our problems. Mm -hmm. This might be a silly question. Are we going to realize any of the refinancing of the bonds this fiscal year that we can roll over towards this delta? Or? Well, it's funny you should ask. We just had a conversation today with our financial advisor. The markets have shifted considerably such that uh, in his professional recommendation, it's not worth pursuing. No kidding, after all that. It well, no, it's, it's worth the, it, it was worth the effort. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it was his barometer exercise. is that it needs to produce a net present value savings of 4% or better, and it's well, sub-4 at this point, and not yeah. looking favorable. So before we incur costs of rating yeah. agencies and, and those sorts of things, his recommendation is not to pursue it. Yeah, that's interesting because we thought we were moving pretty quickly, not passing off, I guess. So. Yeah, there's a couple million bucks we yeah. lost. Yeah, yeah, no, that's just S yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I, you might have been able to move two weeks faster, but uh, these things take time. And actually, I think it's probably been a little bit longer than that because he kind of, we asked about the bond rating meetings and he kind of put it off and he put it off and I think it's because he could see this starting to happen. And uh, if we had had the bond rating meetings and we didn't bond, we would still be required to pay essentially 75% of that cost, which right. is like just under 50,000. Right. So. That's a big cost to not do anything. Uh, City of Bangor made the same decision yesterday that yeah. uh, they were going to advance refund and have decided not to. Okay. So, I, you know. Do we need to report out on that the next council meeting? I mean, just so I'm, people I'm pleased to at the next yeah. council yeah. meeting. That was literally just happened at 3.30 today. All right, real time. But I take solace in the fact that we have somebody looking out for us and yeah. pulling the trigger yeah. not to do it, so. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the 2010, there were four years that they were looking at. The 2010 and 11 will be callable in, in a year from now, roughly. Right. So right. in March of 2021, we could just do a regular refunding yeah. and, um, yeah. you know. By retaining those options. It yeah. would still be tax exempt. We wouldn't have to, right. you know, yeah. be taxable yeah. and all of those other things. So, wow. so yeah. this is a very good segue into the next agenda item. <clears throat> you know, but sure. thanks, Tom, for that update. Sure. But yep. I'm sounding like Johnny or Johnny OneNote here on the, the list of property that we have, the list of town-owned property. And I know when I say that, people are probably thinking I have in mind a fire sale. That's not the idea. The idea is, you know, what what property do we own? Um, you know, uh, what type of property is it? Uh, are these things that could be fungible assets for us at some point? You know, uh, what's what's the overall value? So I'm not looking to cut into initiatives like uh, land trust efforts and those kinds of things. I'm just looking at, you know, what do we own? What do we operate in some cases? And, you know, are those things that you know, we should be in that business at all, or is this a good time for us to start trying to understand the value of those and, and having them at least on our radar screen as potential assets to draw on if we if we have to, so. Well, the town has a policy on that point. I think the policy is instructive in that yeah. it, um, it has a fairly elaborate or thorough process to, to vet those decisions, yeah. uh, really based on getting input from a number of different sources whether there's a current or a future intended public purpose for public property. And I did provide a copy of your policy uh, in the packet. That was great. I appreciated that. I read it, and it did strike me that there is, uh, even though we need to follow that process, the, the council is not obligated to follow any or, you know, any or all of those recommendations. Uh, True. So, so, I mean, I think it's kind of... It's good to know, but it's also good to know that we're not obligated by it in terms of uh, having to make a financial decision about it. So, um, and I don't know, this is, this is part of a new dialogue I think we're trying to get into as a town in terms of really vetting some of these big financial questions and getting people, getting it, you know, uh, people to understand and, and to see the tr potential trade-offs involved and the implications from various decisions. We get it all on the table. So. So, I, you know, that's just, I don't know, Tom, how, you know, uh, how much of a project that is, but I think it would be helpful, at least at a committee level, to take a look at that. Um, and I, I don't know if we've done it in the past or uh, how much work it takes, but that's, that's the request. Or, or, or I guess specifically where I was, and 
you know, because I think I, we had talked about this being an agenda item. I think what we have talked about for the last two years, as we've looked at the budget and capital projects, we know there's a property on Black Point Road that we currently rent that has to have extensive renovations done. That's going to be in the, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, Tom? A new boiler, a new heating system. I mean, I think we're carrying almost 800,000 in improvements. Um, or it's a significant number. And I guess, I guess the question I specifically we talked about, is that a property specifically that we should, we're just renting it, and if it has no public use, and if we have to put significant resources into it, is it something we want to hold, or do we, this could be a way to get to your solution, Paul, about the 500,000. Right. Um, We'd have to sell it quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I will say we've done the analysis uh, to understand on a year-by-year -year basis since 2011 it covers its costs in terms of the lease revenue um, all in. Um, Councilor Hayes' point is well taken uh, that doesn't, this, this analysis doesn't contemplate a you know, large capital investment that, that is on the horizon. So that's part of the impetus, I think, for the conversation. So, so I think to have it on the agenda, the real question was, I think we need to make that go or no-go decision if we're going to hold it for real estate value or lease revenue. That's one thing. But I'd be interested in the analysis if we have to put it in. It was significant. I mean, it was, I mean, I, I don't have the capital project in front of me, but it was a heating system and roof, I think. Um, if yeah. we're going to put 800000 into it, do we get an ROI, or are we better letting it go on the market and taking that cash in? Yeah, my recollection is the number was 200000 and that just seems extreme to me. I think that's a placeholder at this point. I've, uh, if I've asked staff to uh, further research what that actual cost is to replace the heating system in the building. It's an old steam system um, at this point. So it's, it's fairly elaborate, uh, replacing piping and all the like. Uh, so it's 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 not cheap for sure, but uh, it's certainly not eight hundred thousand. That's not what I'm recalling. Um, plus, if a vendor does purchase it, we're not going to get true value for it because they're they're going to reduce the amount they want to pay for it because they know they have to replace all of that. Well, but my guess is someone who's going to purchase it is going to do extensive renovations. I mean, they'll they'll probably convert it to apartments or condos or something. This else. happened before my time, but what I was told is uh, there was quite a hue and a cry in the community when the old Dunstan School was sold. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the circumstances were, um, yep. and Don, you might yep. I don't recall remember. something about it. But, I, but there's a, another element to this as well, not only sort of, uh, you know, it's something that we own that maybe we don't need to own, but it's also an issue of foregone tax revenue, right? We're not paying ourselves taxes for it, right, if we own it. So there's no tax, no property tax coming from that. We are receiving a payment in lieu of taxes. On okay, that we are. Are they equivalent to property tax? It's or? the assessed it's value times the tax rate. Okay, all right. Yes. So, so for 29 Black Point Road, we're getting pilot payments. Correct. That, that's, yeah. if, that's if, good. if you like, we can, I'll share the analysis that shows right. the actual costs uh, year by year so you can see yeah. costs in and out. But I think we, you know, I don't know if we need to see that analysis. Well, we probably want to see the analysis for that particular property, but the, 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 the general question remains, you know, what's the list look like, what's the universe, the total value of that, and you know, I haven't seen a document yet where that's listed. Well, we know. have two things. Um, we have certainly our insurance schedules have yeah. town-owned property that's um, not terribly right. detailed. I'll right. tell you location and acreage, I think. Uh, we do have a, a very extensive fixed assets list yeah. that, uh, again, I'm not sure how it easy yeah. it will be to decipher, but those two things are readily available. Yeah. We can provide that. So I, we'd like to see that. I mean, whatever you can rely on, that's uh, not going to require a big project to pull together. But it, th these are big numbers, and I think we need to get our arms around them. We need to kind of get, uh, certainly as a finance committee, as a starting point, get a, get a word. Okay. I guess through the chair, I'd like to be a little more specific. I'd love to see by the next finance committee, if possible, just an analysis of 29 Black Point Road. What, yeah. what is the investments we need to make? What is the return on investment for that? What is its market value, approximately? And make and I think I think the I think those expenditures were I think they were put in the budget for next year. So I think before we get to next year, part of the finance committee should make a recommendation about. 
is that a property that we want to retain for its value or is it a property that we want to spin off and, and not do those improvements? So Tom, go ahead. How many buildings do we have that we have tenants with? So that, so, because I, I hear a lot of times Black Point Road being brought up, right? So that sounds to me like it's a very specific scenario that we want to analyze. And that, is that the only, like, okay, so I'm, I, if it pleases Peter, I, let's put that in the form of a motion because I feel like that this has been touched upon at least six times since I've been on the council. And I would like to, I think this would be great to actually sit down and instead of a, list of all our fixed assets if this this would be a great one because it's been mentioned from various counselors members of the public i would like to put it in the motion and actually go through the process can we go through and do it okay and can that be amended to include a list of uh, town owned property i'd like to do both you know if we're going to start wading into yeah, that yeah i'm just thinking about the cea policy too so i'm trying to third the cea policy uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. i'm just trying to keep i'm we trying to think agenda items right, right. other yeah. uh, so, but this we've got, uh, the next meeting is November 27th. I know we've got Thanksgiving between now and then, but. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, actually that would be the night It'll before be Thanksgiving and I will be making pies. <laughs> I, say, I think I'm gone. Yeah, I'll be gone too. So, that, well, so, we got to put that on our. You might want to have it the week before. We rarely we meet in November. That meeting. So yeah, be three weeks yeah, but you know how this council is. <laughs> Thanks we'd, for we'd love pointing to. that out. Yeah. So could we do that? Can we have that as a motion one more time? Yeah, can you put that in the form of a motion? Yeah. yeah. So motion that for the next finance committee meeting there is a detailed analysis of 29 Black Point Road about return on investment so we can make a go or no go decision about do we hold on to it and also have a comprehensive list of other properties that may maybe the finance committee should review. Do I have a second? I second it. All in favor? Can we discuss it first? Oh, sorry. I think I think that's too broad of a motion. Uh, but but, but I'm but I'm going to support this motion. <laughs> I'm just saying I think it's too broad of a motion, just specifically because our good use of our time. I think we could use 29 Black Point Road as a springboard of yeah. hey, what did we just learn from that exercise? Yeah. What maybe we don't need all of it. Maybe maybe there's certain things why we do the exercise that we could get more specific on other properties. Fair point. Um, other discussion. No, that's okay. fine. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have a word it. They, so they didn't respond. But they didn't respond. Uh, I, Tom said a lot of this is is available, publicly available. Let's sure. the first pass okay. of what's publicly right. available, not turn it into a, another dinner, turkey yeah, dinner. It's prepared so, for uh, another purpose, but at least it's a listing that exists that shows town property that might jog your memory. Then mm -hmm. let's let's dust it off and bring that along. We go from there. How's well, that sound? Well, no, well, now I'm confused. Uh oh, because <laughs> because I. I thought what Paul was saying, that the motion would be at least have a starting point of an analysis of 29 black people. Correct. I was going to amend your motion, and that's why, but I said, no, let's just talk about it. So I, I would just, I think it would be a better use of the next committee meeting to just specifically talk about 29 Black Point Road. Oh, I and see. I and I, I say see. and I say this I with an eye towards. I also think okay. we need to put the CEA else. policy yeah. on the next Fair meeting. Enough. And I really think that those two should be right. the focus. So we'll can we okay. uh, vote on the original motion? As yeah. amended. <laughs> right? Yeah, that will start over. Sort of yeah. All right, I'll make a Wait, board, the board point. A motion that for the next finance committee meeting that what's brought forth is an analysis of 29 Black Point Road for discussion purposes. And I'm going to second that. Okay. All those in favor? Thank you. Thanks for bearing. And I'll yeah. be I'll be seeking those documents otherwise. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, we'll thank get you. There. Yeah, yeah, wait. Who are we kidding anyway? <laughs> <laughs> for a subsequent meeting, or someone else to have a subsequent meeting on it. But thank you. Thanks for that, Tom, and staff. Uh, so I'm going to suggest that. Uh, it, so we've got about ten minutes left. I don't want to go. I think we've touched on policy and statutory debt limitations in the mm -hmm. metrics part there. You have that. Can we go through that and we'll leave the Very school quickly. bus stops, private public roads just off to the side for a moment? Sure. <laughs> so in item 4F, you've got um, a table at the front that just shows you the um, four different categories of debt that we have identified through state statute. And then we also use that same language in our, in our um, financial and fiscal policy. 
The, according to the 20, June 30th, 2018 audit, so these are audited figures, um, the amount of outstanding bonds for each of those categories. The um, financial and fiscal policy limit is shown um, in the next column over, our current percentage where we are currently. Okay, so let's use school purposes. We by policy are allowed to have 5% um, in bonds for school purposes. We're only at 1.4%. And then allowable and debt margin, that's showing you how much money we could have by policy in school bonds right now. And the debt margin is simply that allowable amount minus what we currently have in those astounding, okay? So you can see that we, um, by policy, and no one is recommending this, so, okay, but by policy, we actually have $243 million that we could still bond if I hit our policy, okay? Um, the next couple of pages that I just included as some background material, you have um, the financial and fiscal policy um, on that next sheet that shows you town of Scarborough local debt limits. Okay, down at the bottom of the page, and you'll see... Um, School purposes, storm and sanitary, and you'll see those percentages. Then you have on your next page in your packet um, the statutory. This is from your this is from your CAFR, the audit um, that was published for 2018. And this is showing that according to state statute, school pur purposes can be 10%, storm and sanitary can be 7.5, municipal airport water and special districts can be 3%. And all other can be 7.5. And then state statute allows for a total of 15%. As a reminder, our town policy is much, much stricter. So we only allow 8.5%, not the 15%. And each category is also much lower. So the state says we're way good here. The, the state says we are way good. That's a good way to think about that. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the debt margin for the state is approaching, what is that, 300, 600? 500, 500, 507, so almost double our uh, local okay. limit. Okay, so that's a lot. They like have it for small favors. Right. Be there. So okay. this is, um, I, for whatever solace and comfort it gives you, the town of Scarborough is well below all of its not only statutory debt limits, but also its town adopted policy limits as well. Was, a wise man once told me, um, <laughs> just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. So I would just, you know, must leave it. that's in the back of my head. But thank you for that. Uh, and it's interesting because when I went through this the first time, I thought, well, we're, we, you know, we're in, you know, uh, we're hitting, you know, close to the wire on some of the stuff and we're not. However, there are other implications, obviously, to, sure. to taking on additional debt. So we'll kind of leave that there. Uh, I want to make room for public comment, and I think we'll... Uh, well, before we do that, though, on the public-private streets thing, the reason that came up is uh, this was an issue um, about school bus stops. Tom reminded me that we need to be focused on town issues first and not really school issues. So I'm sure there are a bunch of other people that would say the same thing. So why don't we do that? Why don't we wait till it comes back, rearing its head in another form for sure. the town council, if the group is amenable yeah. to that? Well, and we'll, I mean, the only thing I'd say is it's, yeah. it's just not the, the bus stop issue. It's also snow plowing, correct. 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 trash removal, and other things which are a town correct town issue. Uh, and, and we are coming. To, we're coming up on the required one-year report out from the downs, correct? Yes. So yes, let's make that required one-year report out because I'm confused on on. I've heard. I know it's probably all there for me to read it, and, um, but I am confused on the 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 services part of this. So I think that would be a great thing to include in the report. Out. So we should be seeing that or hearing. That. I reached out to them last week okay. to remind them that um, there's a requirement, and yep. let's get on the on the calendar. December twelfth or whatever, right? Was the date? So, and we haven't seen much yeah. of him lately, so he'll be very. <laughs> I see him every Monday night. Um, right? <laughs> time now for public comment, and if there's anyone here, usually by this time the 90 minute mark, uh, we, the public has abandoned us. So. Uh, I see no interest in public comment. Uh, we'll talk about future meeting dates. We're going to look to move that away from the, the night before Thanksgiving. <laughs> so we'll come back with another date on that, maybe the week earlier. Um, and with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Thanks yeah. very much. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Meeting closed. Uh, no. Where are we? Let's trust that we work. Really, without the lightning. Let's redo it. Yeah. Oh, Did you get this? Oh. We can redo it. Thank goodness. I. I so. Yeah. Hey,
the, uh, Peter, the thing I had told Dante was just uh, we have homework to. We're okay. Yeah, we're done. Thanks. So we had the CEA policy, right? That came out of Rosa policy. Yeah. And then we looked at it, and then she tasked us to look at it, and and we just dropped it because of the budget cycle. So I was just trying to. Oh, I forgot to mention that. that the tip policy. What's that? The tip policy. The tip policy.